Shall we get started, Mohammed? Uh, we are live, but I cannot see the camera on YouTube. How about now, when when we are talking? I can see you on Zoom, but not on YouTube. Um, let me refresh. Okay, I think it's coming out. Yeah, I think you have to talk. Yeah, you can start. Thanks. Okay, great. So. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session in Seminar in Computer Architecture. In the first talk, um, Marco Imboden is going to present a paper, which is, was published in FAST 2020, a study of SSD reliability in large scale enterprise storage deployments. Marco is a first uh, semester master student in Department of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering. He is especially interested in low-power electronic design and low-power storage systems. And I guess he's interested to present this work. So feel free to start. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to my presentation about the paper, uh, a study of SSD reliability in large-scale enterprise storage deployments. The paper was published first in FAST 2020. Uh, the paper was created in uh, from the University of Toronto in cooperation with NetApp. First, I will give you the executive summary. The problem, reliability of SSDs in enterprise storage system has not been tested so far. Therefore, this study will examine the reliability of SSDs and the reason for failures in enterprise storage systems. The challenges are to find sufficient data sets and finding reasonable failure categories and other investigation criteria. The key results are one third of all failures are preventive based on prediction and regularly updating the firmware can prevent from data loss in an easy way. Here I will show you the outline. First, I will present the paper and in the second part, I will give you the analysis. For the paper presentation, I will start with introduction and background and then move on to related work to the methodology and in the end to results. And in the second part, I will present you the strengths, the weaknesses, the takeaways, and in the end, we will have the discussion. Let's start with introduction and background. As we all know, saving data is very important. The most important points when storing data are the access time, of course, we don't uh, want to access, we want access our data in very fast and we want to save it very fast. Uh, we won't uh, pay too much for saving our data. But the most important point is the reliability. If you want to store our data, we want to be sure that our data is safe. And that's where this study is talking about. In the last few years, the storage changed from uh, hard disk drive to solid state drives and so also the focus of research changed a little bit that's of, uh, because of the ssd drives are faster they have less power consumption because of the there is no there is no drive which is uh, using power and the ssds of course are smaller different storage types we have the two major storage types built up here on the left side, you can see uh, distributed storage systems. There are different servers or different storage are all around the world or on different locations. And on the right side, we have an enterprise storage system with a centralized server. And there all data is stored on this server on the same location. And all hosts are directly connected to this server. Of course, both have advantages and disadvantages. A distributed storage system is faster for remote access, so for accessing the data over the world. Uh, same time data access is possible, there, should no, there shouldn't be a problem if thousands of users are accessing the same data. And of course, it's more fault tolerant, because if one server is down, you have all, uh, other servers which take part of, of this server. And uh, in an enterprise storage system, they are faster for local access, of course, because every host is directly connected to the server. 
But at the same time, data access may cause some problems because if thousands of people are accessing the same times of data and there is just one server, it be, can be a problem. Um, but uh, an advantage is that the data is very uh, is ha has a higher data integrity because of the data is stored locally. You should know uh, what's happening with the data. Uh, let's jump to the related work. Several studies based on data centers from Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and Alibaba are already tested uh, things about reliability, but they are all talking about distributed data system, and no one is talking about uh, enterprise storage system with centralized storage. And also, they did not make some failure distinctions. This study is very uh, focusing on this point. We have failure categories and we know uh, what the, the, the severity of the failures are. The first study, a large scale study of flash memory failures in the field is talking about Facebook and is published in 2015. It's the first large scale study of SSDs in a field focusing on how many memory errors manifest, but it's on distributed systems. Another study would be about the data storage of Microsoft. Uh, the paper SSD failures in data centers, what, when, and why was published in 2016. It's the, uh, as the title says, it's the analysis of what, when, and why characteristic of SSD failures. And around 500,000 SSDs were analyzed. The third study from Google with the title Flash Reliability and in Production, the Expected and the Unexpected was published in 2016. It's also a large scale field study with different flash technologies, MLC, EMLC and SLC. And Bianca Schröder is also part of the, uh, of the authors from the paper, which I'm discussing today. The last paper is the newest one, Lessons and Actions, What We Learned from 10K SSD-Related Storage System Failures. It was published in 2019. It analyzes both device errors and system failures and is particularly focusing on failures that are reported as SSD-related. And the goal of this study, as I already told you, is focusing on large enterprise storage system where the storage is centralized. And they are focusing extremely on the reason of failures, the reason of drive replacements, because it's very important to know what is the reason. So the scope of the underlying failure will be investigated. And if it's just a data loss or it's just a prediction is also important. Let's jump to the methodology. That's a very big part of this paper. Um, the stored data, uh, the, the, the analyzed data comes from NetApp. NetApp is a storage vendor or not not a storage vendor and a storage systems vendor they have storage systems and all NetApp clients send uh, active IQ bundles this uh, of course if the the client is uh, agree with it and this NetApp I active IQ bundles contains no information about the stored data it's just a log file uh, with some information about PE cycles failures device role and array for example yeah, and so on. And this data is sent to NetApp every week. So we have no creation of data. So the drives are not forced to a failure. We have uh, we are in a in real use, and the, the telemetry data of 1.4 million SSD was collected and analyzed. A separate data set contains information about each drive failure and also the failures. So if a drive was uh, failed, the, they noted about when, what, and all circumstances they could. And different drive families were investigated by the study. So 1.4 million SSDs are a lot. So we have different drives here. We have uh, from free vendors, uh, storage systems from capacities from 100 up to 15.3 terabyte with different flash technologies, EMLC, 3D, TLC, SLC, and also different lithography, as you can see, and PE cycles from 10K up to 100K. So this is a lot of data that was collected here. Um, as you all know, for sure, um, but 
or remember here you can see an SLC drive that uh, stores one bit per cell, MLC technology stores two bit per cell, and TLC stores three bit per cell. The health matrix. To find out if a drive was health or unhealthy, so the, the authors defined three health matrix. The first health matrix is the percentage of spare blocks consumed. In this uh, paper, all analyzed devices have spare blocks uh, from 2.5% of its capacity. This is substitutional storage space. I will explain it later. And of course, there are a number of bad sectors. So if an, an error occurs, which is not recoverable, this area counts as a bad sector. And of course, the annual replacement rate, the number of device failures divided by number of devices. That's an easy point. Let's talk about the percentage of spare blocks consumed. This is substitutional storage space, as I already told you. If the controller um, sees that there is a, a failure on a drive, uh, an area which is not responding anymore and it's useless, then they will substitute this area with an area from the spare blocks. And so the, the end user did not notice it, this and had still the full capacity of the drive. And the other one is the number of bad sectors that are sectors that cannot be read, that can be because of physical damage of the cell or of, uh, because of a software problem. Maybe also from manufacturing, there can be a problem still from the beginning on. And this can lead us to use a spare block. And of course, as I said, the annual replacement rate is one of the most important ones. This is the number of drive failures uh, divided by number of drives. Yeah. Let's jump to the results. This is a very big part. Um, here you can see the drive failures, the, the categories from category A, the most severe category, up to the category D, the least severe category. Unluckily, category A has 33% of all errors. And luckily, also 33% are in category D, and category D is just predictive. So this is a predictive failure. This brings us to finding number one. One third of all drives displacements are associated with one of the most severe reason types. But on the other hand, one third of drive replacements are merely preventive. There are uh, many factors that are impacting the device failures. Um, for example, usage and age, flash and drive type, capacity, lithography, firmware versions, and others. And I will talk. Uh, about these categories now. Here you can see two graphs. On the right side, that's a graph about EMLC drives, and on the left side, about 3D TLC drives. And on the y-axis, you can see the annual replacement rate uh, in, in correlation to the uh, replacement categories. The offers uh, made two subcategories here in red, uh, or where the Rated life used less than 1%. And in blue, you can see rated life bigger than 1%. And the rated life, this is just the PE cycles used divided by the maximum PE cycles of this device. Uh, so most of the devices in this study were used less than 1%. So they are nearly new. And so therefore, they decided to, to make this category. So lost rights error, category B errors decreases rapidly in later stages. You can see here, that's the biggest difference. For rated life used more than 50%, the predictive failure increases. You cannot see this here because uh, rated life used more than 50% are not that much devices. So we have just a small number of devices with rated life more than 50%. But this was found by the authors in addition. The expected behavior for usage in H would be this bath tube curve. It's very known from reliability engineering. You can see here a short initial period of high failures followed by a constant failure rate. And in the end, you can see uh, increasing failures. And this is the actual behavior from the study. You can see on the left side, the conditional failure probability uh, in correlation to the number of months in field. That's two times the same. Uh, this is just with a subset of devices. I will explain later why. 
you can see it here, uh, 12 to 15 months are increasing failure. So that's much longer than expected. Followed by six to 12 months, slowly decreasing failures. And in the, in the end, it's, there was a stabilized failure rate. But um, here, the authors tried with a subset of drives to make it more like the bath tube curve because they thought that this initial period are overlapping with all other devices so that uh, so that the initial period was longer than it really was. But as you can see it here in a, in a subset of drives, it's, it's more or less the same curve. So uh, it's not as the expected bath tube curves, even not for a subset of drives. So this brings us to finding number two. We observe a very drawn out period of infant mortality and see failure rates two to three times higher than later in life. Flash and drive types. The study analyzed uh, SLC, MLC, and 3D TLC drives. Uh, from the MLC class, they are two subcategories, consumer class and endurance class, enterprise EMLC. But uh, Overall, the highest replacement rate are associated with 3D TLC SSD, and no single flash type has noticeably higher replacement rates than other flash types studied in this work. So the authors could not find a uh, very much difference between the flash and drive types. So they talked just uh, a little about this. And uh, so other categories as lithography or capacity have much higher influence than just the flash or drive type. Let's go to the capacity. The study uh, analyzed different capacities from 100 gigabyte to 15.3 terabyte, as I already said. The number of bad sectors increases with higher capacity. That's shown here. From up to, from 400 gigabyte, for example, in 1.9 bad sectors up to 3.8 terabyte and almost 15 bad sectors. So this is almost proportional. You can say that uh, a small drive has almost the same bad sectors as a, as a uh, proportionally the same as a big drive. The annual replacement rate. Here you can see the annual replacement rate in correlation to the replacement category. That's the same uh, in both graphs, but on the top it's for 3D TLC drives, and on the bottom it's for EMLC drives. The differences begin for capacities bigger than 1.6 terabyte found the offers. The rate of predictive failures, that's category D here and here, uh, decreases with higher capacity. So it's much more difficult to predict a failure for a higher drive than for a smaller drive. Uh, and most severe failures, failure category A, increases with higher capacity. This can clearly see you here. That's unluckily the case. So drives with very large capacities not only see a higher replacement rate overall, but also see more severe failures and fewer of the more benign predictive failures. That's bad news. Lithography. You can see here two graphs from about the lithography. That's almost the same as before. Uh, the annual replacement rate and the replacement categories and the two devices, 3D TLC drives and EMLC drives. Uh, the annual replacement rate is twice as high with 1x nanometer compared to the drives with 2x nanometer lithography. And for the 3D TLC, it's uh, exactly the trend is exactly reversed. You can see this here. That's not obvious, I think. And failure category A are the only one which are not related to lithography. This leads to finding number five. Higher density drives do not always see higher replacement rates. In fact, we observe that also higher density EMLC drives have higher replacement rates. This trend is reversed for 3D TLC. Let's jump to the firmware versions. Um, NetApp became weekly uh, data from all the, the clients. And this in, in this data clients, in 70% of all snapshots, the firmware version was the same. So that tells us that the clients uh, did not update their firmware regularly. That's bad, because the earliest firmware versions have much less reliability than the older ones. You can see firmware version 1 and 2, they are much higher than the other ones. 
So this is because of later firmware versions include some bug fixes. Yeah. Most failures category B and C are in this table here are lost uh, writes and timeouts from category B and C. And these failures can be caused by a software problem. So they can be fixed in later firmware versions. So finding number six is earlier firmware versions can be correlated with significantly higher replacement rates, emphasizing the importance of firmware updates. Let's jump to the number of bad blocks. You can see here three graphs on the top. Uh, you can see over different drive families, the annual replacement rate in correlation to the drive families. And on the bottom, you can see also the annual replacement rate for in, uh, in correlation to the responding replacement category. And uh, on the left side, it's for 3D TLC drives and on the right side for EMLC drives. And here, the offers also distinguished between an empty defect list or zero bad sectors and with non-zero bad sectors. So uh, it's visible that blue is dominating here. So uh, it's much a higher re annual replacement rate for a non-empty defect list. Category D failures increases. Therefore, we can conclude that predictions of failures May might be based on the defect list. It's category D failures are increased everywhere. The correlation is also in the other, other, other failure categories there. And similar, similar results are also for the consumed spare blocks added the offers. Finding number seven, SSDs with a non-empty defect list have higher chance of getting replaced, not only due to predictive failures, but also due to other replacement reasons as well. And a similar finding for the spare blocks, SSDs that make greater use of their over-provisioned space are quite likely to be replaced in the future. Correlation between drive failures. Here in this graph, that's a little bit difficult. They are the cumulative probability um, in correspond and the corresponding days. So given that already one failure was occurred, this is the probability that a second uh, error occurs in, uh, in this time difference. And of course, here are just drives in the, in the observation that are that got more than one failure. So in 50 days after a first failure, the probability is over 60% that the second failure occurs. Uh, here you can see a random drive failure probability in a rate network is 0.05%. So it's a very low number. But if the drive failure probability following within a week on a previous drive failure is almost 10%. So if there occurred one error, it's very, it's highly probab probable that there is another one following within a week. So that can be caused by rate reconstruction, for example, because this imposes an additional load to all the other drives in the rate group or also because of in a centralized enterprise storage system, they have all shared environmental conditions. If one drive was overheating, the probability is high that also the other ones are overheating. And the same for a power surge, all devices uh, suffer in the same way. So let's jump to the influence of rate group size. Here you can see three graphs about the rate group size. The first one is rate groups that experienced at least one error and here at least uh, multiple errors. And the third one here is rate groups with at least one following up error within one week. Bigger rate groups have a higher chance of drive replacement. This is true for uh, a rate group size smaller than 18. This you can clearly see here and also on the middle graph. But following up drive replacements are not correlated with the rate group size. This is visible in the last graph. There is no, no correlation to the group size. So while large rate groups have a larger number of drive replacements, we find no evidence that the rate of multiple failures per group is correlated with rate group size. The reason seems to be that the likelihood of a follow-up failure after a first failure is not correlated with rate group size. 
Let's jump back to the executive summary. So the problem was the reliability of SSDs in enterprise storage system has not been tested so far. So that's not true anymore because this study did. The goal of the study was to examine the reliability of SSDs and the reasons for failures in enterprise storage systems. Challenge to find sufficient data sets and finding reasonable failure categories and other investigation criteria was solved by this study. Let's jump back to the results. As we just saw, one third of all drive failures are merely preventive based on predictions. And regularly updating the firmware can prevent from data loss. And this is a very easy way to prevent data losses. Let's get to the paper analysis and jump to the strengths. This is the first large scale enterprise storage system. Therefore, this is for sure uh, uh, a good paper in this direction. And a large amount of data was analyzed, data from about 1.4 million SSDs. So there is a huge load of data for, from very different drives, different vendors, different storage sizes, different capacities, different lithography. Everything was inside here. And uh, it's a long time data range. So the data is, uh, was collected over two and a half years. So the, the data has to be very accurate in my eyes. And also, I, uh, I like it that they used uh, existing data, so from real life, the data, and did not force the, uh, some drives into failures for, for uh, investigating it. So it's really uh, the most accurate thing you can do. You can use real data and analyze it. Uh, the comparison of the data is very detailed. Uh, so if you have seen before, there are uh, the, ca the capacities are compared and also the lithography is compared and all these uh, things are very good compared to each other. The weaknesses. The failure type is missing in 40% of the collated metadata. This was written by the authors. But these failures were proportionally spread over all categories. So in my eyes, it doesn't make sense to, to spread this proportionally over all categories, because if you don't have the, the failure type, you cannot spread it overall. You should have an additional category with failure type missing or something like this, or even neglect this data. But to spread the data over all categories doesn't make sense. That's just that they have more data than they really had, I think, in my eyes. In the chapter usage and age, remember with the bath tube curve, they used the metric time in months. And in my eyes, it will be better to measure the age and usage in PE cycles because of the drives, uh, uh, the drives age is not uh, one month or two months because if the drive is two months old, but never used, it's almost new, I think. And uh, they did not compare these results to similar research about uh, hard disk drives. It would be interesting, I think, to know which categories are different from H HDD drives uh, and so on. But maybe this was out of scope for the study. Let's jump to the takeaways. The firmware version should always be updated. That's very important. The using already available data can lead to new insight. That's not, not much work to do for creating the data. You can use already available data and you have a lot to do. Some failures can be predicted with software and this should be the future. We should, able, we should be able to find as few, uh, as much as failures as possible just with software. There we can uh, prevent from data loss. Data backcore. Backup or array is very important, even if the drives are very reliable today. It can still occur that some data is lost. So be aware and have a data backup or array network. Let's jump to the discussion. The first discussion point is what kind of data storage would you prefer for a startup? Startup company with a centralized, uh, uh, centralized enterprise data storage or a distributed data storage? You can see the different drives all uh, here. I talked about it before. So which one of them is safer for, a, for a, a startup company? A distributed system, they are not all at the same location. Uh, they are connected through the internet. Maybe this is a problem. And uh, with a centralized data uh, solution, all hosts uh, can access the data offline. But uh, if 
there is a, a, a the, the, the server is burning or whatever, then all the data is lost. So what do you think? Also, if the from the access time, the access time can vary a lot. Should they use a distributed system or a centralized data system? Yep. Maybe we have a microphone. Um, so I would consider the distributed system to be safer mm -hmm. because usually you also replicate your data. So if, for example, um, a data center burns down, yeah. not that great, but you still have your data, and especially for a startup, uh, it's quite essential to still have their data. Okay, yeah, it's uh, safer uh, according to reliability. Um, yeah, other words about this? You could also maybe have a centralized one, um, since for a small company, which is probably like based at one point, the access time would be better probably. Um, but you could maybe like once a while do backups such that if there is a problem, not much data is lost. Yeah, would be a good solution. Yeah. You have other, uh, some additional things to say? Yeah. You want to talk? Thank you. <clears throat> also, most likely for a small startup to set up a centralized storage system is a lot cheaper than building distributed systems. It also requires probably extra locations. So you need to build up data centers uh, all over the place. To, That's to of make course it the point. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it could also count as a, a centralized one if all the data centers are closed. So cost is also uh, probably a, a very important factor. Yes, especially for a startup, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah pretty much. Yeah. That's it. Um, I would not necessarily agree because today you have a lot of subscription models from the big cloud providers. Plus, these people are specialized on this topic, and a lot of startups maybe don't. They just use it as a exactly, tool. Exactly, yes. That's a point. So you can see it's uh, not, uh, not one has not uh, just advantage. Uh, both of them have advantage and disadvantage. So from case to case, it's uh, they have to decide which one is better for them. So you, do you have any additional comments on this topic? And let's jump to the second question. How can we use this study to improve reliability or other things? So we have now uh, a lot of results from this study, but uh, in the study was nothing. Uh, they did not improve things. They just uh, did research on what where are the problems? Where are the failures? But how can we use this study to improve failures? Uh, to improve reliability, of course. Yes? So, <clears throat> sorry. So basically, at the end, you said that because of the correlation, we can probably predict some of the failures already from the uh, various health metrics or something. And then, if we could do the prediction of, for example, we can say that the drive is going to fail in a week. Maybe we could already start the uh, how to say to redistribute the data on that drive to other drives, for example, and then tell the system admin to. Like, okay, now you need to take this drive out already before it actually fails. Uh, this way we can avoid the cluster going, like the storage cluster going to this degraded state so that we either have lower reliability guarantees or we have lower performance. And yeah. Yes, of course. But then you have to uh, to exchange almost all the drives in the RAID network because you don't know which drive will fail within a week. You You know, just one will fail for 
maybe uh, I think it was around 10%, but you don't know which drive it is. I mean, so, but you still have the metrics for individual drives. Yes. And with, yeah, maybe you can. Maybe with some additional analysis. Okay, could, yeah. Maybe yeah. That's what, that this would be a good point for, for a research, yeah. yeah. Some other comments? I have, for example, one point. Uh, we could improve failure prediction. As we saw, the failure prediction is uh, almost one third of the failures are predictive. Maybe we can improve this uh, prediction as well. Uh, more or less, we can uh, fitting the failure prediction to a specific failure category. So that's um, almost what he said now. We could maybe predict this failure in the in a rate group, the, the following up failure. Or also with higher capacities, the failure prediction decreases. Maybe we can have some research there, or there is already some research, so that we can find these drive failures before, before the data is lost. And there are also some other parts. Maybe you have one more in the meantime. If there is no one, then I will jump to the last question. The last question is for a centralized enterprise storage system. Which flash type would you choose? We see here different uh, flash types, SLC, MLC, TLC, and QLC, or also 3D TLC can be used. But uh, as more bit per cell, as less PE cycles are, use, uh, are possible with this drive. This is clearly visible here from SLC, you have 100,000 PE cycles, and in a QLC drive, you have just 1,000 PE cycles. So, uh, yeah, that, this is a disadvantage of the QLC drives. But 3D TLC has great advantages. For example, they have more PE cycles than 2D TLC. They are, have a higher density at lower cost and also lower power consumption, but the reliability is less good than, for example, with SLC. So for a centralized enterprise storage system, which flash type would you choose? Is there a specific one you would choose or would you mix it or what is your, your choice for this? I mean, I guess one thing, it depends on the scale of everything that you're doing, right? It's like, uh, if you're saying that you have a, so we're talking about centralized the stuff. And then uh, if we are just like a startup, uh, I guess to balance between the uh, performance and reliability issues, we can maybe have MLC or even TLC uh, because, and then have a cold backup, for example, on hard drives uh, should suffice, I guess. Okay. And then, but then if you're super, like super scale storage company, for example, like your Amazon, and then you, maybe you have different tiers of availability and performance requirements. So for, I guess you can also employ QLC, QLC drives that have huge cap capacity, but lower reliability in this sense. Reliability can always be, how to say, made better by adding backup and also some multiple, like how to say, duplication and stuff. Uh, yeah. And then lastly, if you are a super, like if you really want the high performance, but also, uh, high reliability that you may use SLC, but those are very expensive nowadays. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, that's my view. Yeah. Thank you. That's the point. Are there any more comments on this? Yeah. Maybe if you have data that changes very fast, you should prefer the L uh, SLC. Mm -hmm. And if the data will be stored basically forever and hardly ever used, you could use the QLC because you will never rewrite it again. Yes. So long-term storage could be QLC. Yes, it makes sense. In my eyes, this is these are all good comments on this stuff. Is there maybe some more comment? So if there is no more comment, I will uh, thank to my mentors, to Mohammed, uh, Rakesh and Hao Song for their help. It was uh, really nice to have them and to, to improve my presentation skills, I hope. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you for listening.
Do you need the presenters more? Uh, no, actually not. But I would like the pictures of the other or two. I know it's a song that I was. Nobody has seen anything. Um, Only on YouTube. No, no. <laughs> um, how do I get presentation? Um, where's the button shortcut? Oh. Yes. Where it is? Thank you. And we can use this. Oh, perfect. Let's make sure that everyone can see you and see you. Can everyone see the slides in Zoom? Uh, not yet. I guess we see the camera, but you didn't share the oh, screen. The slides, no. Can, we, can you check my laptop, Jiran, to see the slides? Can you hear me, Constantinos? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. I guess you didn't share the slides, but we can see the camera. Is this on the ears or because like yeah. this? Or no, 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 no. You need to the other side. Can you stop the camera as well and then enable it? Half of it frozen, half of it active. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not that intuitive. <laughs> The camera is not working. Very weird. What is very weird? Half of it frozen, the other half is working fine. No, sorry. Uh, on YouTube, it was fine actually. Now? Well, maybe it's changed. Yeah, the first talk was fine, but now I think some. Oh, okay, now there's some problem. Okay. Probably the cable moved or something. We still have a problem, right? Yeah, you might need to reboot it <clears throat> or use the smaller camera. Yeah, so it's happening with the in the in the break as well. Now I can see myself. So. Probably it works. It should be working now, right? It works now. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Constantinos, can I introduce uh, Moritz? Yes, I guess you can introduce. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you and good evening. So our next presenter will be uh, Moritz Mani. Moritz is a third year bachelor student in uh, computer science and uh, his research in interests are uh, hardware, software, uh, uh, interaction between hardware and software. And uh, today he'll be presenting the paper, uh, AMD prefetch attacks through power and time. 
that was published in the uh, in at the 31st uh, Usenix Security Symposium in 2022. Uh, most Moritz, uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So welcome to my presentation. Uh, as Rakesh said, it's about uh, AMD prefetch attacks for power and time. This paper was written by uh, Moritz Lipp, Daniel Gruß, and Michael Schwarz. Perhaps you know these names because these were also co-authors of the of the papers on Spectre and Meltdown. So you know they know what they're talking about. And here uh, they presented it in the symposium that is basically a, a conference for the newest advances in uh, security and, and uh, privacy. So now, why exactly was this paper written? Well, there is this thing called meltdown or in a broader sense, prefetch uh, side channel attacks uh, that work really well on Intel, but researchers have tried to do it on AMD and haven't quite succeeded for a long time. So uh, this is our, our, our background that we have. Now, the motivation is, of course, just because researchers tried and failed to, to mount uh, successful brief uh, side channel attacks on uh, AMD. It does not mean at all that there is, it is not possible. So certainly, um, we always have to try and uh, try to find these vulnerabilities. With this paper, they want to show that there are vulnerabilities. They want to find them and they want to exploit them. And of course, they want to also give us solutions uh, to their attacks. Uh, the idea is to use uh, difference in cycles and uh, power consumption of different prefetch attacks uh, to, to gather information about the addresses that they prefetch. And the results of them are that uh, they, they succeeded, the attacks managed to gather kernel information uh, on the architectures that they tried, so AMD's Zen and Zen 2 architecture. <clears throat> uh, this presentation will go the following way. Uh, we do a little bit of background, uh, things you should, for the most part, already know. Um, then we look at where, what the vulnerabilities are, afterwards how we can exploit them um, and then of course how we can hinder the exploitation of them in the conclusion it's just just the compilations of, of all the um, achievements this paper has done and then uh, in the analysis i will say some strong points uh, weak points and my personal takeaways from the paper in the discussion it's your turn to sort of think about uh, things, concepts from the paper, but also in a greater sense. So we'll start with the background. Uh, virtual memory, memory, it should all be clear, just a small refresher. There was a thing at the beginning, there was physical memory and you have these programs that uh, don't quite fit in there. You can see uh, the whole program, uh, the two programs wouldn't both fit in physical memories, but researchers noticed that uh, not all memory of all programs gets used at the same time. So what they did is partition it into pages and they mapped the page, just the pages that are needed into physical memory. And like this, we see uh, program one is now mapped all the things that it needs. For program two, it is also all the things that it needs are mapped and we still have space in our physical memory. Now, because this mapping means that uh, with each memory access, we have to do a translation. Uh, this slows down memory accesses. So the TLD was introduced, the translation look aside buffer. This works the following way. Recent uh, memory translations are getting, uh, were getting uh, cached. And then if we want to translate something, we look at the TLB, is something cached? If yes, then we have the translation right away. If no, then there is a TLB miss, and we go to the page table and start the process of a, a page table walk. <clears throat> now, for summarizing the whole thing, uh, for virtual memories, it augments memory. It uh, gives more memory for, for different programs, but also memory accesses get slower. But with the TLB, we can mitigate this and, and a, uh, with the use of caches. <clears throat> Now for the prefetch, you can see it's all about the addresses. First, we look at where the address are located. Now we look at how we 
can get these addresses quicker because normally we have this pipeline and that that just has to stall because it wants the value of x uh, x and then it tries to get x but uh, during this time it can't do anything about it same with y so now we have our idea of prefetching, fetching before we load, uh, we do the load instruction, and then we already have X. The stalling time is is um, is uh, thrown away, uh, so we don't have to wait anymore. Um, these prefetches are very powerful because they cannot raise exceptions, so you can just like access anything, and it gets loaded into the cache. You you can even access uh, kernel kernel address, uh, prefetch kernel addresses. And this makes the cache vulnerable, but also there is of course faster execution overall. <clears throat> now for the address space layout randomization, this is now um, how the addresses get uh, reordered because um, we have this randomization um, this is a, a broad concept, but in this paper, we look at kernel layout, uh, address layout randomization. So Kaslar it is called, and it basically randomizes the, the whole kernel layout on every system boot. Uh, here with an example, how this could look like. You have uh, you have some code, you have some some segments, and then on a boot, they get reordered in a in a pseudo random manner and then on the next boot you can see they change location again so this is the basic principle of it and we have to do this relocation because there are certain kernel bugs there are um, functions or addresses in the kernel that are vulnerable to <clears throat> to certain attacks and that's why we have to run they had to randomize it so that you can just go on your home system, find the value where these addresses are, where these functions are, and apply that to every other computer that exists from the same, uh, from the same company. <clears throat> now, Kaslar itself is vulnerable to meltdown attacks, but uh, so Intel changed, changed its Kaslar, but as AMD is not believed to be vulnerable, it still uses the Kaslar and we can exploit this fact. Now, for, for the vulnerabilities themselves, first, we have to look at how we exactly get the vulnerabilities. We have our timer. Um, we work with time, prefetch timing, and this is just a timer that is equivalent to, to timers that you would use in Intel processors, um, um, which is very good because we want to have a comparability between Intel and AMD. Then for power, we also use an interface uh, driver, which is uh, comparable to, to Intel drivers used in previous Intel attacks. And then a perf performance counter, it is like uh, for, for our analysis. We do analysis and prefetches. We, we uh, find thresholds where we can say like, uh, 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 where we can infer information from them. And we use equivalent performance counters for Intel and AMD because, again, we want to have this comparability because at the end, we want to apply uh, concepts that are already uh, looked at in Intel but are not really uh, looked at in AMD yet. Uh, these performance counters are uh, privileged. So there's only privileged access. The other two are for any user. But... Uh, as we only use the performance counter for, for like the one-time uh, measurement for our thresholds, uh, we can do this like on our home computer and uh, this wouldn't be needed in, in an attack because we already then have these thresholds. <clears throat> now for the prefetch leakage, this is the first thing that we can actually leak with um, our primitives is the page table level. So, and uh, if a physical address is cached in a TLB, there's no page table walk. Uh, this is clear so far. But also, the fewer page tables uh, mapped for an address, the earlier the page walk uh, aborts. This means with the exp uh, it gets a bit clearer with the experiment that they provided. They had four different addresses that they know are on different page table levels. So, um, when the address translation starts, 
like goes into the uh, page directory pointer table, which you see uh, is the lowest cycle time. And then uh, this basically provides a location where to look in the page directory. And then this provides a location where to look in the page table entry. And then this provides the actual, actual page. But this is not always the case. A page table walk can already have translated the old address or already a board in the page table entry um, level or even in the page directory pointer table. So um, you see the sooner this, this page table walk aboards, the, the less time it takes. And with this experiment, you our assumptions are proven. So uh, this can be quite intuitive. Uh, the important thing is also that this is also true for inaccessible addresses. So we talked about it earlier. Uh, prefetches don't raise exceptions. So we have these inaccessible addresses, which are, of course, much more interesting for us, um, which we can uh, uh, distinguish the page table levels for. On Intel, they have done the experiment also, but there there is inverse behavior because the page translation, uh, the address translation in Intel works bottom up. So the page would have the lowest time and uh, the equivalent to the page directory pointer table would, would have the, the highest time. Now, the second thing that we can leak is the TLB state. This is just if an address is cached or it is not cached. Um, Intuitively, a non-cached address takes longer to retrieve than a cached one. This is uh, clear so far, but we have to back it up. So they did an experiment. Uh, they set different permission bits. They tried different memory types uh, on different architectures. And what is very good for us is that they found uh, with the TLB hits, you can see uh, 87 across the board, 87 uh 87 cycles and TLB misses 148 cycles. And you can see this difference. You can see our assumption is proven for every architecture here. And just after this experiment, we can really work with this. It is not just an assumption. It is like we, we tested it and now we can infer the TLB state. <clears throat> now, how can we actually exploit this knowledge? Well, first, we have, uh, they have, uh, um, they have uh, Im invented some techniques. So the first one is prefetch plus time. Just uses the timing of a prefetch instruction. Um, it uh, is able to leak the page table level after just one, uh, measuring one prefetch instruction. Um, but uh, for the TLB state, it has to make multiple TLB, uh, multiple pre um, prefetch instructions to then average them out to, to get to infer the TLB state. That is why on Zen um, architecture this works, but on Zen 2, which caches uh, inaccessible translations right away, uh, this cannot work because like the first measurement is pure and afterwards it gets cached anyway. So you wouldn't know, like you would always get a cache state. Um, here's how this would look. For example, to infer the TLB, uh, the, the page table level, you take the time before and after the prefetch, uh, the prefetch instruction. And then the difference is, of course, how long the instruction took. And then you have your thresholds that we um, that we deduced with our, um, <clears throat> our uh, performance counters. And then we can just check if if the threshold, uh, like if the time is under the threshold, this belongs to this level. This or if uh, like if the threshold doesn't hold, we go to the next one, and then to the next one, and then to the next one. And with this, we can infer our uh, page table level. Now with prefetch plus power, we do something similar, but with power consumption. And there we are only able to leak the page table level and only after measuring several instructions and averaging them out. It is uh, even after arbitrarily many instructions, it is not able to leak the TLB state. So this is a shame, but uh, we have um, we have our experiment. It could look something like this. 
you have like for for a million times you measure uh you start your your energy driver your energy interface and then uh, you make your prefetch address and then you look at your spikes you look at the power consumption in general and average it out and then you can go through your thresholds and like with the prefetch plus time uh, find your tlb level the last one is tlb evict plus prefetch this exploits the eviction policies of tlbs so eviction policies you all know what it is uh, right so can someone name me like a, an example of an eviction policy there are a few sandra <laughs> you for example fifo fifo yes first in first out there's also other there's least recently used there's most recently used least frequently used etc so this is all basic stuff um we are able to leak the page table level on send two and finally we are able to leak the TLB state on Zen2 architecture. This is because <clears throat> we like start with the, we had it before. The first prefetch plus time is like a, a pure measurement. And afterwards, the, the, the address translation gets cached anyway by Zen2. So what do we have to do? We have to evict this last translation that it did. And then we are at our original situation and we can again do a pure measurement. And we do this for enough times so we can average it out and finally get um, work again with our threshold if it is cached or not, and finally get our TLB state for the Zen 2 architecture. So now we can already work with this prefetch, uh, uh, evict plus prefetch, by establishing a covert channel. A covert channel is basically. Um, just a, a channel where two users can communicate with each other without the, the kernel wanting to, or the, the admin uh, wanting them to, to communicate. So there we use TLB evict plus prefetch to encode a bit string of information. So one user sends a bit string to the other user by caching translations of kernel pages in the TLB. How does he do this? Well. Uh, the sender and the receiver, they agree on one uh, inaccessible kernel address and they monitor it throughout the whole uh, address transmission. Then the sender evicts the address, so it is definitely not in the TLB. Um, and then it prefetches the address if it wants to transmit a one or it idles, it does nothing if it wants to transmit a zero. The receiver doesn't know what the sender did so it prefetches the whole time and if uh, the execution time is low then it knows that the sender prefetched the address the address before so now it is cached and then uh, it knows that the sender transmitted a one if the execution time is high it knows that the sender didn't uh, prefetch the address so it idled so it wanted to transmit a zero and that's how they managed in practice to uh, to transmit the bit string. Uh, you can see the, the the marked areas there are ones uh, because that is where the execution time constantly goes uh, uh, under the threshold that they that they found out with the with the performance counters. So. The first one is already really interesting. Uh, the second one is a Kaslar break. So we had our Kaslar, um, and now we de-randomize this. Uh, we reverse this randomization. So what do we do? The idea is basically that there are timing differences between um, mapped and unmapped uh, kernel addresses. So we just prefetch kernel addresses and look at them. Uh, in Intel, there is already there are already some kernel uh, Kessler breaks, but again, they work with time. On some AMD uh, pro CPUs, this doesn't work. There is no timing difference, but there is a uh, power difference. So what they, they do, they measure power consumptions when prefetching addresses for all possible randomization offsets with our prefetch plus power primitive. This would look something like this. So you can see the spikes in power consumptions are at certain offsets. The yellow uh, area is the actual uh, location of the kernel. And uh, well, you can see that we, uh, we, we, we found it, <laughs> the, the energy spikes and there the kernel is. 
Now, you would think that randomize uh, that trying all possible offsets would take a long time, but with 0.15 seconds, uh, this is not a lot. This is like on par with state of the art uh, Intel Kessler breaks. <clears throat> on Zen 2, we can work with time. So we use it there and um, you will see we get we get something uh, very, very nice looking. We do the same thing just with time and with TLB evict plus prefetch instead of uh, uh, prefetch plus power. And what we get is this. You can see that uh, the ex execution time is lower for the mapped addresses. And that is also where the kernel actually lies. And it's just, you can see it even without the yellow strip, you can see oh, there is something going on there. And um, that's what's great about it. Um, now we can also break fine-grained Kaslar. What is fine-grained Kaslar? Well, Kaslar um, randomizes the layout of the kernel, but the fine-grained Kaslar also randomizes the functions within the kernel. So this is uh, another layer uh, on top of Kaslar, but we can also break this. Now, the, the problem is it is necessary to find the base of the kernel and the location of the function within the kernel. But we can already find the base with our Kessler break. And then we do something called a function activity uh, template attack. This works the following way. Uh, we evict a target, a target address translation from the TLB. This is where we think uh, the function could be. And then we execute the function. Now, uh, we prefetch the address again and measure the execution time. And if the function that we executed is at this address, we know that it is cached. Um, and then the execution time is low. The other way around, uh, seen the other way around, you could say if the execution time is low, it is uh, very possible that there uh, lies the actual function. But there can be multiple uh, such uh, 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 multiple cases where it goes under the threshold. So we just constantly repeat this process, lower the threshold until there is only one um, candidate left. And here you see an example of this. They uh, do this with the IOCTL syscall and throughout the whole, throughout all of the offsets, you can really see the spike where it goes down, where the actual location is. <clears throat> now, what we can also do is spy on kernel activity. There, what we do is we de-randomize the kernel address space using Kessler, uh, our Kessler break, and then we evict TLB entries, uh, which we monitor afterwards. Uh, there, we let us get interrupted by another process, or we even relinquish control of the core. And then the other process comes this is our victim and it, tr it, it does its things. It accesses code, it accesses addresses, it does address translations. And every time an address translation is done, it is uh, put into the TLB. And afterwards we can come in again and look at this TLB and look at, oh, which addresses were cached. And that's how we know what the victim has actually done. So, um, yeah, this is it. If timing is low, the monitored address has been accessed and uh, the attacker has gained vital information about the, the victim. Here, they did an example with a phone coupled by Bluetooth to a laptop and to a, to a PC and they played a song. And you can clearly see in the marked uh, area where the song played from when to when uh, and that it played the whole time because all these prefetches are under the threshold that they uh, that they uh, determined, and I think it's just amazing that that you can you can infer something like this. Now, the good thing for AMD security is that cross core monitoring is not possible, so you would need the same thread to uh, access the same uh, TLB. <clears throat> now. Also a thing that you can do is leaking kernel memory with Spectre. Um, you perhaps, I hope you remember how Spectre works from the uh, presentation about Speckhammer, but uh, if not, basically it just 
has a brand, there is a branch predict, there are these spe specter gadgets, uh, which look like this. And then you mis mistrain the branch predictor and the speculate, uh, and then you provide like a, an, a certain offset that just takes the branch and then there is a speculative execution which uh which provide which puts data in the tlb that shouldn't be loaded into tlb and uh that data we can read then so what we do is we find the kernel address with our can uh, casla break that is um yeah and then we do a normal uh, specter attack so we must train the branch predictor we do an out of bounds access and then uh, with our offsets uh, offset that we control and what we do then is we do tlb evic plus prefetch for all the possible byte values that could have been loaded into the tlb and look at that they were able to find for um they were able to like read actual memory and uh, read out the the string secret, which uh, they uh, is what they called their secret string string, which is of course uh, very original. But uh, yeah, I could talk about this like for for ten minutes, but the time just wouldn't su uh, suffice. So we need to talk about how we can actually prevent these attacks. Well, the countermeasures are. Um, of course, page table isolation should be augmented, should be made better um, to mitigate these castle outbreaks. Um, this could work with a method called uh, kernel page table isolation, KPTI. And this basically unmounts uh, the kernel address space when in user mode. Um, in practice, this looks something like this. Uh, the problem is you can see execution time is constantly higher than in normal mode, but uh, you can't see any difference between where the kernel lies and where the kernel isn't. Uh, another thing that you can do is the fake load address response called flare. This is an easier method. It just provides dummy mappings for the ker whole kernel address space, which means that every uh, address is mapped and it's logical that uh, then you don't see any difference between uh, where the kernel is and where the kernel isn't because uh, not only the kernel uh, addresses where the kernel itself lies are mapped but all addresses so this will both prevent um, the Kessler breaks but the other for example flare because it only provides dummy mappings it doesn't really uh, help against any other attacks that are talked about in this paper. Um, then we have uh, prefetch configura uh, configuration in uh, MSRs. Uh, this could be, for example, a bit that is set that uh, like says, uh, if it is set, oh, this is dangerous, you should treat it as a no-op. This will, of course, introduce overhead and uh, the need to, to modify hardware. Um, what we could also do is like use kernel location conventions like i understood it from the paper there are like kernel is mostly located either at the most significant bit of memory at these uh, address locations or at the least significant bit and so we can use this to say okay prefetch instructions are not allowed in these areas that would be a simple method but also um would would minder time for uh, would uh, uh, would lead to more time for prefetches in general. Um, then we could also just restrict access to these energy uh, power meters, which um, the AMD energy driver is the driver that they actually used for these experiments. But the K10 temp interface is uh, also something that works in a similar way that they haven't looked at in the paper that they, that they think should also be restricted. Um, and restricting access to the timing primitives. You could do it, but it's not that good of an idea because many applications use this. Um, and if you were to switch these applications, just wouldn't work anymore. So to, to summarize, it's like uh, improve page table isolation and um, improve the restrict, like restrict access for more 
interfaces and drivers and things. Uh, the conclusion of this paper, where well, where were, where were where were we at the beginning? We had the background that AMD was not believed to be vulnerable. Uh, our motivation is that we should always test these assumptions and uh, show the the contrary. The goal that we actually find vulnerabilities and um, and uh, attack these and find mitigations for them. Uh, our idea was uh yeah using cycles and power like time and power and you can see that the goal was completely reached the results speak for themselves but now the contributions themselves are that we showed that uh, side channels uh, side channels undermine the isolation between user and kernel space and amd cpus uh, we also introduced new primitives that other people can use for their attacks uh, prefetch plus time, prefetch plus power, TLB evict plus prefetch. Uh, they, they, they did attacks, they constructed attacks, they were able to, to break Kaslar and fine grain Kaslar. They were able to monitor kernel activity, establish a covert channel, and um, even leak kernel memory with Spectre gadgets. And they proposed the mitigations. So KPTI, Flare were already there, the prefetch instructions were their idea, uh, the access restrictions. AMD has actually restricted uh, access to the AMD energy driver in response to this paper and another one. Um, and timing, well, there is no intelligent solution for it yet. So this will remain a problem. For my analysis, the strengths, it, it's definitely the scope. This paper is uh, the scope is huge, I think. It's it's just these attack primitives, this free, but also the four attacks that they've done that are like uh, have a variety in them uh, and, and all in just a single paper. Also, these attacks are not just some complicated uh, things. They're, they're like easy to understand. You read the paper and you think, oh, I get the concept of it. And uh, with the graphs also, it's it's like easily visible where the kernel lies or where the one bits are or where the song was played. So uh, this is really all uh, really easy to see. <clears throat> it not it didn't leave behind the train wreck, so it also proposed solutions for all the uh, securities that has broken. And um, for me personally, it's just a really interesting concept of using power measurement to um, to exploit. Uh, they released all their code on GitHub. So if you have free time, you can look, go look at it if it interests you. And uh, the whole paper is 20 pages, which is not much for this scope, but uh, nothing feels like they completely glossed over it. So that is very, uh, that is also an art to do. And um, now the weaknesses, definitely uh, the execution measurement. They, they talk about four different ad, uh, virtual addresses that they measure. But like if you if you have bad virtual addresses like um, that are really near each other in access time or really far apart of each other in access time, your threshold can get, can get skewed. And perhaps I don't know if they did other uh, if they uh, measured other virtual addresses, but if they only measured these four, this could possibly lead to wrong conclusions, wrong thresholds. Uh, also, in the paper, there is an as experiment about stalling behavior on AMD, but they say even in the paper that the stalling behavior is already documented. So I don't really know why they did this. Um, also, there are abbreviations in there that just aren't explained there, that are just expected uh, that you know them. And for the Spectre part, it is also expected that you know a few things about Spectre. They have a background section, but this could have easily been in the background section that they just didn't include it. So yeah. Uh, for the takeaways, uh, security vulnerabilities, um, and relative, there are still security vulnerabilities. So uh, computers are very important. They're getting important, more important day by day, security also, but it's just, there are still major security breaks that are being found every day. But 
uh, it is a good thing that they are being found by scientists and not by uh, malicious actors and um, that they are constantly trying to be fixed. So this is very reassuring. And more specific to the paper, I think KPTI, uh, which mitigated uh, all of the attacks in, in the paper, um, is the future of kernel security. But for example, for Spectre, uh, it, it doesn't help against Spectre itself. So this would still have to be mitigated by other, other means. Now, for the discussion, it's your turn. <laughs> To, to think about a few things. So we talked about this uh, timer and that is, it isn't really easy to, to uh, restrict access to it, but it's still a major security concern if you can have just this really accurate timer that uh, is, is user accessible and that you can just use. So uh, what do you think? What could be solutions to 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 this problem like would you find a way to to successfully restrict the timer without disrupt disrupting all these applications or would you even uh, have another idea to to just make the timer unusable yes i say something before we proceed to the discussion yes No, no. Okay, you can hear me now. So about the paper itself, you said that in the part of the mechanism, you can evict the TLB entries, right? Yes. That's a critical part of the mechanism because if you don't evict them, then you will have hits always and you will not understand what's going on. How do they do that? How do they evict the entries? Uh, well, they use uh, like certain uh, eviction strategies. They just like uh, they say they use eviction strategies and they cite a few papers. But I thought for like for the, the paper analysis itself, this wouldn't be uh, uh, like it's it's enough to to know that they just used eviction strategies that other papers have already come up with. Okay, yeah, because this takes time, right? Evicting the entries based on other papers, even based on other papers, takes time. Yes. Because you need to evict them from both uh, L1 TLB and L2 TLB. And you also need to evict them from the page walk caches. Because after the L2 TLB, uh, you don't stop, right? So while performing the page table walk, you have an extra, some extra caches. So you need to be able to evict from all the hierarchy, throughout the hierarchy, which affects the throughput of the attack, right? Um, which is, I think, not discussed in this paper. The, no, it is. The, yeah. Um, now you can proceed with the... I understand why you didn't discuss it, though, because it's quite <laughs> complicated. It's another paper, right? Mm. So what I wanted to say to the timer is maybe you could just not prevent the usage of the timer, but maybe make it a little bit less um, detailed or a little bit less um, yeah, detailed. Because I think this is also a solution proposed to Spectre that you um, make the timer a little bit less accurate and then you cannot um, time the cache side channel attack. Um, Yes, and I think most applications don't need an extremely precise timer, but they are fine with a timer which is kind of accurate. This is uh, also one thing I have uh, I have thought about. Yes, for for one, it, it's also it's always like it's not easy because uh, of course they would have come up with it if it would be that easy. But um, yeah, it's certainly a solution to re reduce the uh, resolution timer to perhaps have a similar situation like with the prefetch plus power that we just, no matter how many times we measure, we can't uh, infer the TLB state. And maybe we could even make it so bad that we can't infer the TLB level. Um, 
that would be some solutions. But then again, you have, uh, I'm sure this timer is so accurate because there are some applications that use, that have to use this accurate timer. And um, yeah, it's, it's a complicated uh, theme. So are there any other ideas to it? Like even if we would implement it this way, we we still have like either way, we we have applications that we that just won't work anymore afterwards. So what can we do to to fix this problem? To yeah? Yeah. Uh, maybe so the, the problem is that some applications require the precise timer, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we have uh, some kind of a privilege uh, system where uh, basically we don't let uh, those uh, mean applications, those the attacker applications uh, use the, 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 the great timer, but we still allow, <clears throat> we still allow like for a high privilege application to use the timer. But that's another problem because existing applications also break that don't have the privilege but still rely on the timer yeah yeah uh, maybe uh maybe thinking about it not in a way that is like privilege uh, yeah it, it is a privilege i don't know yeah it's uh, an interesting dis discussion because uh now when we talk about which applications to to grant this privilege and which uh we would uh, just leave behind we could have a whole 10 hour discussions about how to distinguish friend or foe in, in computer architecture and computer science in general. And uh, it's really not easy, but uh, this is this is of course a solution to just have a privileged timer for certain applications that ab absolutely need a, a accurate timer and a unprivileged timer with a low resolution for the rest. Now there is also, uh, an answer that I have come up with that is perhaps a little bit too simple, but I thought about what if AMD says, well, we are going to privilege the whole timer or we are going to make the timer worse so that these attacks can't happen anymore. And we are going to do it at the um, by the 10th of December, 2023. And then all these developers or, or all these uh, companies that uh, have these applications that uh, need these timers have time to uh, change their application to not be reliable anymore on these specific uh, timers. So that would be a solution I came up with. Uh, this I just thought about it because um, it is a similar principle to 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 like other other uh, uh, companies that that sort of announce a big change before they do it uh, so that everyone else has to, has time to adjust to it. So th this would be my approach. But of course, uh, reducing the resolution of the unrestricted timers, that's what you said. And uh, of course, uh, that's an idea I haven't come up with, just doing a separate privilege timer with a high accuracy. That is also a very good idea. Another con, yeah. Another concept with the timers. So always there will be someone in who writes extremely good software and can leverage the existing hardware, who can bypass all these and creates its high resolution timers, regardless of what you do, right? Yeah. Because using coarse grain timers, you can create high resolution timers. Um, there is a concept called constant time hardware, let's say. Mm -hmm. giving a, where the TLB or the translation subsystem will reply to you with a constant time, which means even though you have an L1 hit or an L2 hit, or you hit in the first level of the page table, the second or the third, the, if the fluctuation of the values, the deviation is low, then the translation subsystem will always take 50 cycles, always. That's a, of course, incurs really high overheads, right? Mm. But it's a solution because you will not be able to distinguish anything. You will see only 50 cycles, which is a solution that, of course, causes high performance overheads, right? Yeah, I think it's always a, a trade-off of, um, 
of uh, uh, performance and uh, security. And uh, parenthesis, the same cannot, or the same is really hard to happen with power on how you can make everything constant power. Yes. That's much harder. And right? uh, later we will see something that's uh, whip power that is really mind blowing. So, uh, but another concept that I have thought about here is um, like randomized prefect execution time. That would be something uh, in, I guess, in the same direction that you just randomize it in such a minuscule way that like the, the, um, the, in the address translation on like the, the address on the page table level below with the higher, with the, with the lowest, uh, cycle time on this page table level, uh, could have a higher cycle time could have a lower cycle time than the uh, address of the page table level above with the lowest cycle time. So just that you that you have at the borders of these uh, page table levels that you have uh, fluctuating values so that you can't really distinguish between uh, between what is on which page table level. It's just this is less like um, this was more a, an idea that came to me. Uh, like an an afterthought, but uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe one little addition to the um, making timers imprecise. Um, I don't exactly know how the timers are implemented, but uh, I thought maybe you could like make what you do influence the timer. Like for example, if you do a prefetch, you somehow mark it and you kind of try to subtract the time it usually takes from the timer. Yes, this would, uh, this would like go back to, uh, well, the, um, there, the countermeasures where you add a, a bit to, to mark these, uh, these prefetches, but don't treat them as no ops, but just influence, uh, this influences the time. Yes. Um, yes, that is also, a possible but again introducing a bit also adds a lot of overhead so it's always a, a trade-off now for the next point um can you think of other information that could be leaked using information about uh, power consumption yeah back there <laughs> Thank you. Um, mainly because my laptop just died, but I would say like battery, battery life, or also batteries. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You read my mind. Yeah, um, battery charge, because um, uh, of course you can uh, distinguish between a laptop that is uh, uh, running and the laptop that is dead. That is quite easy, but also like uh, there are some architectures especially on phones that that slow down um power consumption when you're at low percentages and um this you can you can find out with with uh information about power consumption what else could there be think about um like situations where certain things are needed then of course power in these areas isn't needed. Okay, well, I'll just reveal it. It's uh, for me, I found out the airplane mode could be something like this, like uh, wireless uh, things that require a wireless network uh, wouldn't sap any power because it is disabled uh, during airplane mode. And of course, low energy mode is, uh, uh similar to to the battery charge the similar reason do you have any other ideas uh yeah in the paper they have uh, 
just thrown out a few concepts. Like in this paper, there are a lot of papers mentioned that they just say, oh, these guys did this, these guys did that. And it's all really interesting, but of course it's too much to read everything. What, what is very interesting is that they, they found, there was a paper that found out uh, on a phone, of an, on a mobile device, if you're on a website or on an app currently. So this is a, apparently something that you can find out just through power consumption. And they could um, infer which keystrokes you've pressed. So that is a really crazy concept for me. But again, it's just um, like you would have to read the whole paper to, to really get how this is done. It's just to think about all these uh, all these things, aspects that use energy consumption that you wouldn't think about before. <clears throat> now, we have established primitives and methods to make side channel attacks, prefetch attacks on uh, AMD. Do you know any Intel side channel attacks that we could apply to AMD? So. Uh, I don't expect you to to like list out a plethora, but perhaps you have heard about something, uh, some attacks that that could be applied here. Well, I won't uh, make a presentation about each of these itself, but of course, meltdown. There isn't. There still isn't like a. a, a, a attack quite as devastating as meltdown uh for intel uh like uh, an an amd equivalent to to like real meltdown so it is like wait, this was the first real prefetch uh, side channel attack that we were successful for perhaps we could try more and perhaps someday we'll find uh like a really devastating meltdown attack um, yeah, it's just an, an explanation of it. Then what they discussed, they uh, in another paper, they could uh, attack OpenSSL. So just uh, get some cryptographic keys by uh, monitoring prefetch activities near lookup tables. This is uh, an Intel attack that uses uh, the, the instruction pointer um, uh, prefetch. Another attack on Intel is tag bleed, which um, because Kessler is uh, adds overhead, tag TLBs were uh, added to, to optimize this, but these also introduced new security flaws and vulnerabilities. So these could again be broken to break Kessler and um, yeah, this could be like if AMD goes in the wrong direction of uh, of uh, further developing uh, kernel isolation, then perhaps uh, they run into a similar situation that Intel has run into uh, at that at that moment. Uh, other attacks that I find very interesting, uh, it's uh, called Platypus. It's uh, not that interesting of a name, but uh, it can also extract uh, cryptographic keys and distinguish uh, energy consumption for 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 instructions and Hamming weights. Um, this is just to extract again some cryptographic keys. And now Hammerscope, which is like mind blowing for me. I think I even wrote it. It's no, it's just uh, when I read this, it was absolutely mind blowing because again, what what did we say about about power? What was our solution for? for uh, mitigating the, the power type attacks. Yes? Yeah, we restrict it. Absolutely right. But with Hammerscope, we can, they have found a correlation between uh, activation threshold of a row hammer attack and the memory consumption uh, of the memory location. So with row hammer, they can, they can like, do their own uh, energy interface. Like we see this um, when they when they when they uh, compared their findings to 
the Intel Energy Interface REPL, which we use a comparative form for, for AMD and, and these attacks that are in the paper. And we see it's, it's almost the same. Like you have such a high accuracy with this. And this is a, uh, an attack that, that is completely unprivileged. You can, you can, you can just build your own REPL and that's, uh that throws all the the we can just restrict it we can restrict that we can restrict that out of the window it's like uh it was said before uh smart people always find their ways to to build their own uh primitives to build their own uh ways of of uh circumventing these restrictions and that's just crazy to me um i won't go uh yeah it's just yeah for the for our countermeasures that are completely circumvented what restricting access uh concerns but the last one i won't bore you with because time is already running out but again we have we have our things here but now we see um for fixing side channel attacks it's not just a question of we have to fix side channel attacks themselves first we have to fix row hammer and uh, like it all comes back to to this pesky row hammer, and that's just what I find amazing. But now uh, this is just food for thought because every uh, of these speed ups uh, of these efficiencies uh, introduces new vulnerabilities. We have seen it with the tag TLB. We've seen it with the TLB itself, with the prefetch instructions. So just, this is just some food for thought. Now I want to end. And uh, I want to really thank Rakesh because he just um, supported me all the way. He he gave feedback. We we have done so many meetings. He has, he has uh, sacrificed so much time for me. And I'm just glad because I think the product uh, came out good. And I hope you all uh, found it interesting and, and like uh, found the same love for, for these attack papers that I have because they're just so interesting. So thank you very much for listening and um, thank you very much for, for your attention. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the presentations. I'll make a couple of comments. Uh, I don't know if people can see me in the room, but uh, yeah, maybe you can set it up. We don't have much time, but uh, I think uh, the, both of these presentations today were uh, quite nicely done. Uh, it covered uh, both of the papers comprehensively. As mentioned, uh, these are actually quite deep topics, both of them, in fact. Uh, the first one, uh, I should uh, make a point over there. It's, uh, it's very, uh, these large scale studies are always very interesting uh, for memory reliability, SSD reliability, or any kind of reliability. Uh, or availability in systems. And uh, this particular work is uh, quite interesting to me because uh, as was described in the first uh, presentation, uh, we happen to be the first ones to do a large scale study of flash memory failures in the field together with Facebook at the time in the 2015 paper that was mentioned in Sigmetrics. And it's good to see actually that the last paper, uh, the, the, the paper that was presented in 2020 uh, has some similar conclusions. For example, we concluded that the bathtub curve doesn't work uh, for uh, the uh, salt state drive failures that we observed. And this paper concludes in the, the same way, actually. And we had some hypotheses as to why that was the case. Uh, I think this paper provides more data uh, to show that our hypotheses may be correct, but it's very hard to prove some of these hypotheses without uh, more data. Uh, and also, I think uh, the discussion was good. In these studies, it's really important to look at how much the drives are utilized, used, as opposed to a number of months. I think one of the points of criticism was a number of months. And I agree with that criticism. Uh, you may have a, a drive that has been out for, I don't know, two, two years, but the number of uh, writes or program erase cycles it has experienced may be very different from uh, the number of writes uh, another drive that's out for two years has experience. So it's really important to do these studies uh, uh, with, with multiple different metrics uh, to see the differences. 
but I think it's always good to do these studies. And uh, the larger the study is, the better in this, in 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 general, uh, because you can get you can uh, you can look at uh, low large numbers, right? Many 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 servers. In the Facebook study we did, uh, unfortunately, we were not able to uh, mention how many uh, servers, how much memory, etc. Uh, we we uh, how, how how many flash drives, etc. We could uh, we uh, we were able to look at. But it's good that some of the other papers are actually able to mention that. But I should say that it's it's higher than the other studies <laughs> at Facebook, even at that time. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, may, uh, moving on to the second work. Uh, uh, but of course, I think the this sort of studies is very hard to do, right? Because you need to have the infrastructure and the data collection to do that. So in general, it requires collaboration between industry and academia. And if you look at all of those four papers that are mentioned, including the one that's presented, they're all collaborative papers with industry and academia, uh, or or just uh, or they're just industry papers because you don't really have access to very large infrastructures in academia in general. And if you have access, uh, you may not have, uh, let's say, the continuity and the workloads, et cetera, that's, uh, that's really exercising these infrastructures. So this sort of large scale studies is, uh, yeah, a bit tough to do in general. Uh, and in terms of the second paper, I think it's really interesting to look at this sort of attacks in general. Uh, and recently, there have been more attacks looking at the prefetchers. There was, a, there was some work on Apple's prefetchers, for example. Uh, people have shown that there are similar leakage that one can have on Apple prefetchers. Uh, so basically, uh, in, a, in a sense, these are, uh, all of these attack papers are very, very interesting. Uh, because they actually exercise different parts of the microarchitecture. Uh, in some other sense, they're all exploiting some side channels, and uh, it's just a matter of exploiting them, right? People should certainly be uh, reporting these and doing the research, and it's best if the researchers are doing uh, this research and reporting them in a fair uh, and uh, scientific way, as opposed to hackers actually hacking other people uh, without telling anyone, right? So it's good that I think people are doing that. Uh, and I think there will be more to come, as we had discussed uh, in the Rovhammer le lecture earlier. Okay, I don't have anything else to add. Uh, I think we have one more presentation next week that's coming up. Other than that, uh, I'll leave it to you, Mohammed. Thanks, Sonor. Uh, yeah, I believe we came to the end. So we have one more lecture, as Honor mentioned. So please don't forget to take the quiz, and we will have one more quiz next week. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the day, and see you next week. Bye-bye.